some of the things that I read about myself in the papers back then, there was a lot of sexism. Commentary about me, the opinion pieces, were all written by people that I had never met, didn't know anything about me. And it was a real eye-opener for me because if I was a dad of two competitive sons who were starting to find their way in the spotlight, I would be lauded and applauded. And instead, I was pushy mum, overbearing. I've always done this. I've always done this and got excited because I was always the one that was there when there was no crowds. And if they look up and they need some positive reinforcement, it was always me that they looked at. So I kind of trained myself on them. And I have just have always done that. And I still do that. But the sexism thing, there was a lot of sexism back then. My name's Judy Murray, and this is The Female Lead. My mum and dad were actually very sporty and they wanted me and my brothers to enjoy sports. So I remember very fondly playing all sorts of different sports and games. Played in pretty much every school team that was going from swimming to netball to hockey to badminton to athletics. You know, it really fostered my love of being active, which of course I, I still have and which actually went on to become a career for me further down the line. I went to university eventually to do languages, but further down the line, I went over to volunteer at our tennis club, the same tennis club that I'd been a member of when I was a kid, and discovered there were still no coaches there, and I started to volunteer a couple of hours a week. And that was really where I got started into tennis coaching. Always loved my sport, discovered I had a real passion for sharing it. Um, and really, I've, I ended up doing what I thought I'd always do, which is teaching sport to children. My kids enjoyed playing tennis and I wanted to help them to improve. You know, I realized when they were both sort of eight and nine that they were exceptionally skillful for their age, but had enough common sense to know that that doesn't mean that you're going to be a world champion or anything like that. That nothing was further from, from my mind, uh, but it was like, oh, right, okay. What do we do next? What, what do you need to improve? Where do we need to go? you know, for, for competition and so forth. So I was really learning as, as I went along. You know, in Scotland, there was really pretty much no infrastructure at that time. So I started to have to create some infrastructure. I'd gone from working in the club to working in the wider district, and I was the first woman to pass the LTA's Performance Coach Award. When I passed that course, the Scottish National Tennis Coach job came up. And interestingly, it was a woman who persuaded me to apply for it. I did apply for it, and that put me in a position to be able to start to create an infrastructure and create a coaching workforce. And that was what I set out to do. And I knew I had to start small. I had a tiny little budget. I had no staff. There was literally just me and a, a, one of those baskets full of balls and a block booking on these indoor courts. And, and that, was how I, that was how I got going as the national coach. Nobody gave me a shot at achieving anything. By the end of 10 years, I had created a really good coaching workforce by bringing in experts from other countries. And actually, out of my little cottage industry that started out with the parents helping me because I couldn't afford to pay any other coaches to help me, one of the girls who started with me very young, she went on to head up GB Disability Tennis. And one of the other ones went on to be head of men's tennis at the LTA and the Davis Cup captain. You know, it's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And it's so much about investing in people and nurturing them and making them feel part of a team and you all grow grow together. It's so easy to get over-invested in your child because you're putting in so much time, so much money, so much effort to help them to improve. The first Wimbledon in 2005 was Andy's sort of breakthrough year. He'd played at Queen's at the Stella Artois a few weeks before that and he'd won a few matches at that, which was unexpected. You know, he was still a junior player. He was in there on a wild card and he was playing these top players and he, he won some matches and suddenly the media got very excited and then we found ourselves as a family picked out on TV. I bought all the papers, I read everything. I wanted to know what people were saying. What it made me realize was that I needed to learn how to understand the media better. So I went and did a PR course. I learned how to do massage. I learned how to do tax returns in four different countries. I learned all these things because we couldn't afford to pay anybody else to do it. So I went from teaching them how to play the game to learning how to handle the life and business of a professional athlete. Um, and I never imagined I would ever have to do that. But um, 
but I did. <laughs> in 2016, just after Andy had won Wimbledon, I literally finished my book. And so when the book was released, I went on a really quite extensive book tour and I found that actually got a lot of release from sharing my story. And I think from having so many years of being bashed by the media who persuaded everybody that I was the pushy mom, the nightmare parent, etc., etc., it really helped me a lot to actually be able to tell people the backstory and the tennis media, I think they forgave me for everything. So I have a completely different relationship with the media now, but there are still many, many people out there who just think I'm just Andy and Jamie's mum and I hang on to their coattails and I've made a career out of following them around, telling them what to do. So, um, yeah, the doing, doing the book and the book tour helped me personally um, a lot to get my side of the story over. <laughs> <laughs>